Hi everyone, thank you for tuning into the JPIS fundraising live stream. This is a quick reminder for you to click the link in our description box below and donate to our COVID-19 crowdfunding campaign in association with Give India, Uplift and the Ojala Foundation. Moving on, today we're joined by Mr. Gaurav Batra, an SDG ambassador for the United Nations and the founding co-director of AB Tutorials, an organization involved in guidance and preparation for law entrance exams in India and overseas. Most recently, he has won the National Education Excellence Award 2021. And so we are truly honored to have you here with us today. Thank you, Adriana. It is very nice to be with all of you and to have an opportunity to be able to interact with such uh, bright young lives. Uh, I hope that uh, our interaction will be a source of uh, knowledge and information and value to all your viewers and all the other students who look at this. Absolutely. Now hand it over so, to um, So moving on, so we all know how accomplished a lawyer you are. What inspired you to start this momentous journey and how has the journey been so far? So, um, so this is a very uh, strange story. I had gone to the US to do my undergrad. And uh, when I had gone there, I was a science student and uh, I was preparing for IIT. And this is, of course, I think about 30 years back, 32 years back. And um, so I got a scholarship in US. And uh, so I went there to do my engineering. And uh, what was happening was that uh, when I reached there, my first semester grades were not very good. And I was getting very low grades and I was on an academic scholar academic honor scholarship, so I had to maintain a certain GPA. And my first semester, I didn't do very well. My second semester, I didn't do well at all. And I was on the verge of losing my scholarship when I reached out to the, 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 the academic counselor there at the International Students Admissions Office. And uh, so I was very concerned and she said, okay, so well, okay, uh, what we'll do is that uh, we'll, um, we'll run a psychometric test to determine what, what, what you're good at. And, 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 and she ran a psychometric test and you see, that point in India, all this thing was not there. But in the US, all this was very uh, importantly used. And so uh, uh, she did the psychometric test and there it came law and education. So I wasn't really convinced about it, you know. I thought this is not going to happen. I'm a science student, I got a scholarship and you know, this is not going to happen. But in the third semester again, I tank. So I got very concerned. I went back to her and she said, it's best for you to change your major to something which is liberal arts and includes law. So this is how I started. Uh, this is how I started. And I did my education in the US and then UK and uh, then worked overseas for about 15 years. And I worked with various companies, various European companies, uh, Norwegian companies, Singapore, Australian companies, and uh, and uh, in 2000, uh, 2001, 2000, my father passed away. So I came back to India for a sabbatical. I thought I will take uh, three to six months off. And, uh, you know, this thing was running. Uh, this was started by ma'am. Uh, who happens to be my mother. And this thing was running and she asked me, she said, why don't you help uh, children, uh, youngsters? And I was very, I was overqualified for all of that. So I, I thought, what am I doing? Wasting, wasting my time with all of this, you know? But then uh, I thought that I have three to six months and let me, let me take a sabbatical. And, and I started teaching youngsters uh, about law exam and, I don't know what happened right or what happened wrong. That year, I had about 45 students with me in 2000. And all 45 of them got through top three national schools. So 
Oh, that sabbatical which I thought, which was for three to six months, didn't end, and I'm I'm where I am. So this is, in short, what my journey has been about. Remember one thing: as the Buddhist saying goes, that neither the destination is important, neither the journey is important. What is important is the company. So I'm glad to have wonderful students as my company who still keep in touch with me and uh, who are who are uh, uh, who I feel are a constant source of pride for me. That's one with the thing that we'll always keep in mind, sir. Uh, moving on, in today's world, the corporate law is showcased as a very glamorous and a rewarding one. So how true is this and what is your advice for the next generation about the importance and relevance of law? So, uh, as you probably know, uh, law is divided into two, or segregated into two aspects. One is litigation and one is non-litigation. In non-litigation, you have the corporate practice that normally most of the youngsters prefer. And in order to understand what is going on in the country, first you have to know what is exactly the situation in terms of, you know, the Lee and the, the law and the pre-law um, situation. So there are about roughly about two like students uh, who law students in India each year who, who enter various law schools, and about uh, about ten to fifteen percent of them join the bar each year. So that's about sixty sixty five thousand students. Out of those 65,000 students, 10% are from the good law schools, the others are from here and there. So for your for first thing, your aim should be to amongst to be amongst those 10 to 15% students who are who are graduating from the good law schools. In corporate practice, what happens is that because of the economy opening up, as you're probably aware that India is the second largest FDI in the world right now. Of course, with COVID right now, there is no FDI anywhere, but before COVID, India was the second largest FDI. And uh, because of that foreign institutional investment coming into India, the first thing that any institutional investor looks for is not how much revenue they're going to earn on what they're investing into India, but the fact that they want protection on their already, on their proposed investment. Therefore, corporate law or law firm or knowing the rule of the or law of the land is very important because it helps them to protect their investment. So if somebody is investing $1 million, they have no problems in, in shelling out about 15 lakhs just to protect the rest of the investment. Therefore, the corporate practice has gained momentum in the last about 20 years. And at this point, Indian professionals are amongst the highest paid in the world. Matter of fact, I was with, uh, with an ex-student of mine from 2000. He was uh, 99 with me. And uh, he is, of course, uh, he worked at the ICJ. And uh, he is currently the advisor to the Crown Prince of Bahrain. And he came, he was with me for a week and he wanted to relocate back to India. And uh, just to check what kind of uh, revenue or salary he would get, he did some proxy interviews for law firms. And you would be surprised that he got offers and salary package worth three crores to five crores per year. So, so there, is, there is no doubt uh, but like I said, you not everybody gets this. You have to work towards this. So corporate practice is, of course, very sought after. I mean, the glamour depends on which episode of Suits you see. The glamour you can check from there. But there is a lot of hard work. There is a lot of hard work. But it is compensated by the financial remuneration that you get. Moving on to the present time, as you said, how important it is to know about the law of the land. And you know, as India is in the midst of a horrific second wave of the COVID-19 pandemic, how do you view the steps taken by the government of India regarding the vaccination right? And very recently, the Madras High Court called the election commission as murderers. What is your professional opinion on this ruling? So, 
So, first of all, I can't give a professional opinion on a high court judgment. But since I no longer practice law, I am full fledgedly in the education aspect of law. Um, so let me try and answer your question, um, and perhaps I would, I will also try and opine on what you asked me with the Madras High Court judgment. That importance of law. Remember that law of the land is the most important thing. And law of the land is a subset of a greater universal law that we have in the universe. Where did law come from? Where did law come from? Law came from a universal law which exists in the universe and within us. And that universal law which exists within us and the universe is called the law of cause and effect. That law of cause and effect, a small subset of that is what we know as law of the land or law as a subject. If the sun rises, there is light, warmth, cause, and then effect. If you have fever, if you have infection, you have fever, cause and effect. Same way with law, offense and punishment. You do an offense and you have punishment. So law of the land, in my opinion, is one of, is the most important thing because it allows a framework of rules and regulations within which people can live safely, securely. And I believe that dignity and safety of life is the one single most important thing that they can possibly be. Because if there is no life, there is nothing else. Therefore, to safeguard life is one of the most important and paramount duties, not only for ourselves as citizens, but also as the government. It is said that salus populi suprema lex, which means that welfare of the law is a welfare of the people is a supreme law. So, so that is what is my opinion about law and the importance of law. So the government is by the people, for the people, and of the people. So the government's prime duty is to protect its citizens. And I hope that the government will realize this responsibility and will continue its best efforts to safeguard and protect lives as per the resources that are there within this country and whatever resources that they have to borrow. Third thing you said was the Madras High Court judgment. The judiciary is the watchdog of the democracy. They are well within their rights if they observe something to put that respective resource on notice. Election Commission of India is a resource which is available in order to conduct free and fair elections. And if the High Court has seen that there has been carelessness by the Election Commission of India, then the High Court has been very fair and just in warning and admonishing the Election Commission of India regarding the carelessness that might have been observed or could be observed. I was saying due to the pandemic, most universities are becoming test optional and standardized testing such as the ACT and the SAT are losing their importance. So how do you think the LNAT stands as a deciding factor for students applying to university in the UK? No, so it's good. No, all exams are being canceled. What more you want in life? School exams are being canceled. School is being attended from home. I have to insist all videos to be turned on. One of the parents the other day sent me a WhatsApp of a student who was sleeping with a quilt on top of her and had a phone on the side. You know, so I think it's a very interesting phase of life for everybody. 
all exams being postponed, everybody being promoted. Such kind of life is only utopia for Indian students. So you wanted to ask me about ACT and LNAT, etc., right? So let me let me just re-understand your question. Can you can you repeat your question for me? So I was saying that since the SAT and the ACT is losing its importance, how do you think the LNAT still stands as a deciding factor, whether it does or not? So what what is happening is that that uh, the basic difference between UK and US is that in US, they also give considerable weightage to the resume. Whereas in UK, it is primarily academic interface. Now, in UK, there are two sets of colleges, law universities, one that look for LNAT or consider LNAT, the other that don't consider LNAT. Most of the Russell group consider LNAT. A Russell group means Oxbridge, LSE, UCL, Kings, etc. So the LNAT is being conducted online. I mean, they're doing AI proctor. They'll probably do AI proctor from home uh, or with social distancing. Even last year, LNAT happened. There's no problem. So I don't foresee any problem here with LNAT happening. And, um, and by the time uh, September is when the cycle is there. So the cycle starts by September. By that time, things will settle down. So I don't see any problem with airline or happening or anything like that. All right, great. Sir. So we all know about the success AB tutorials have had in the past. However, students today come across a lot of online materials and resources to self to self study for these tests. So do you feel that many organizations who tutor kids for LNAT and CLAT will lose their essence? Or is having a supervised and well-guided path still necessary to pass with flying colors on these tests? So I'll tell you something. So let's say that you prepare for a general knowledge section for the CLAT exam. So do you know general knowledge is unlimited? It's not important how much you do. It's important how well you do whatever you do. So I have seen particularly students having a tendency to keep doing more and more and more and more. And it doesn't matter if you're doing more if that's not relevant from exam point of view. So the online resources, the problem is twofold. One, you cannot verify the authentic, authenticity of the information. Is it correct? Is it incorrect? And, and there is no accountability. How can you go and call up a website and say, listen, you giving wrong answers. So that is where the first problem lies. I mean, I, I myself suggest uh, resources like for LNAT, I suggest Guardian newspaper, various other things. So the online, the main thing is that there is overload of information. And it's very important for you to have relevant information and not just keep assimilating information, a lot of which would be redundant and unnecessary for your exam. You just keep cluttering your mind. And at the end of the day, you'll lose your advantage. So this is what basically I feel that I feel that in India, the other problem is there is so much competition that if you're not doing it, somebody else is doing it. And obviously, if you're trying to learn to drive, and if you've got an instructor with you, or you learn to drive using a self-help drive manual, which one's going to make it better for you? So you could learn how to fly a plane, aeroplane, using an online resource. You can do that. <laughs> So, so today, as you said, uh, it's very important to have a leading figure in your life, a sort of mentor. So did you have someone like this in your life? And if yes, what is one advice that has stayed with you till now? So, you know what a GPS is? Yes, sir. 
What is it? The global positioning system, right? So, is it so suppose you have a GPS in your car, will you get lost? No. So if you replace the G from global to guru, so it becomes a guru positioning system. Yes. So whenever you have a guru with you, you will never get lost. I firmly believe in the mentor disciple equation and relationship. All my students from the last 20 years consider me as their mentor in life. As a matter of fact, some take it a little bit beyond what I expect them. One student was going to get married and he called me saying he wants to me to meet his fiance and I declined completely. I said, I'm not doing anything of this sort. So what happened was that growing up, when you're young, of course, now all of you are very aware of all these things. When we were growing up, we weren't that aware of all these philosophies and guru and important of mentor and this. We were just left and we were expected to fend for ourselves. So as I grew older, I mean, I never had, a, to be honest, I never had a mentor when I was young, younger rather. As I grew older, I started, started understanding life a little bit. And then when I reached a certain age, that is 40, that is when I found the need for a mentor. Till such time, I thought I was okay in life. And then at the age of 42, 43, I encountered Buddhism. And then I embraced Buddhism as a way of life. And there I found my mentor, or friend, philosopher, and guy, who happens to be an international Buddhist educationist, peace activist, and philosopher, who's currently about 92 years old. And he has over 400 PhDs to his credit. So, I have, I have felt that his ideas and thoughts have made the maximum sense to me. And I've tried to use them to shape my life to the best of my ability. So his name is Dr. Daisaku Ekeda, and he's he heads the Nichiren School of Mayana Buddhism. One of the things that that uh, I've kept, rather there are so many things that uh, that I remember and remind myself of what he has said, and he continues to say. But uh, but one of the things that I I remember and I remind and I'm almost memorized is what he says about education. That education is not just the realizing of the inner potential of an individual. It is also the transferring of humanity from one generation to another. So all my students and all, this, all the youngsters that come in contact with me, I, I, I'm proud to say that I, I, am, I, am at, I have over three to 4,000 students, youngsters, not students, youngsters, who, who seek my guidance and counsel on various aspects of life, not just law, not just academics, but various aspects of life. And I've, and I've tried not to make them just brilliant individuals and professionals, but also good human beings. So that is what I hold true to myself, and that is what I transfer to the youngsters who come in contact with me. Um, thank you, Good. sir. And so, another question that I wanted to ask was how important are ethics in a career like law? Because we all know after hearing you talking so much about life, being good humans, ethics plays a very important role in your life. But how important is it in a career like law? So, I will tell you that the young lawyers that I have groomed, 
I mean, I'm so glad to see how, how strongly ethical they are. And, uh, and they're winning cases on merit and they're making their professional life on merit. Ethics in law is like oxygen or air while you breathe. If there's no ethics in your legal practice, then it is like living without air. You will suffocate. Progressively, the new generation that is coming is very, very strongly ethical. They don't want to deal with anything that is not ethical. There is a, there is a complete shift which is happening. There's a complete shift which is happening. And I'm glad to, to, to share with you that ethics is the new tomorrow. Even the foreign institutionalized investors don't want to deal with unethical lawyers. Over a period of time, your reputation as an unethical lawyer can cause your professional practice to suffer. So to whatever I have known of the, the youngsters that have gone through me, they're all very strong in their belief system and they live true to themselves. That means whatever they believe in, that is what they do. Okay, so don't worry about the ethics. Just follow it. You will be more successful in the long run. So now we have an audience question. So considering how law is such a stressful and fast-paced career, what do you think, uh, what, how do you practice mindfulness and unwind? So I no longer feel the stress uh, because it is a way of life. As a matter of fact, if I don't read in the night for about 20 minutes, I don't get sleep. So it is mostly for young professionals and they have different ways of blowing up steam. Most of them travel. What I've seen is most of them travel, they have two days off, they'll just take a flight and go somewhere. So I've seen traveling, reading books, music to be the best way in which the young lawyers who are successful, they blow off their steam. For me now, my spare time is utilized either in reading or uh, in my uh, Buddhist meditations or chantings. And of course, I, I love to travel. I love the nature. So I like music as well. So combination of really everything. You see, there is nothing called stress in life. It's just something that you built up by thinking much about a situation that you should thinking about a situation, you'll see the stress goes down. So I personally feel that stress is something that that, you know, is can be self-dissolved. So I try and just do whatever it feels, whatever day of the week there is, that's what I do. There's no fixed routine, no fixed pattern for you. So, so one question I had after listening to you was that recently I read in the newspaper that in 2019, the government arrested 1900 plus people yeah, I see. I see that you're saying that in 2019, the government arrested 1,900 people on charges of terrorism. Only 24 were convicted. I, I'm not quite sure what 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 you're asking, but what I think what you're asking the low rate of conviction. So what happens is remember that each organ of the government has to do their job. The executive is doing their job by arresting people on suspicion, and the judiciary is doing its job by convicting. If there's reasonable element of doubt, then you can't convict somebody. That's how simple as it is. So you can't convict somebody if you have doubt. If suppose you, you have a doubt in one of your friends that he or she has done, done wrong to you, until you have, until you are sure, can you break relations or can you break friendship with that person? No. So there's a law of evidence which is there and, and uh, if, there's a, if there's doubt in that, then obviously you can't be convicted. So this is, this is, this happens. Sometimes you will have high rate of conviction. Sometimes you'll have low rate of conviction. So nothing to worry about from that. It's just the way the dice rolls. 
So thank you so much, sir, for your valuable time and enlightening answers. We are truly honored to gain such important career insights from you, and I'm sure our fellow aspiring lawyers are too. Once again, thank you so much, sir, for those watching. This is a quick reminder for you to click the link in our description box below and donate for our campaign. Thank you. Okay, it's very nice to meet all of you, and and I hope that all of you are happy and successful in your endeavors in life. And uh, and most important thing, remember that that uh, all this hard work that you're doing is for happiness, right? So if the effect is happiness, then the cause must also be happiness. Therefore, I always tell all the youngsters that come in contact with me that be happy while you're working hard. Be happy while you're slogging. Be happy while you're struggling. Because if the cause is happiness, then the effect will hundred percent be. Okay. So take care of all of you. It was very nice to meet uh, such wonderful people, and thank you, Aditi, for your invite. And uh, if there's anything I can do, please reach out to me. Okay. Sure, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Okay. All the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Take care.